Welcome to our special segment, Starting Block, where we focus on entrepreneurship. Of the approximately 33 million small businesses in the United States, nearly 13 million are women-owned. Yet, access to funding and other resources continue to be a challenge, especially for minority-owned women endeavours. Karina Mitchell introduces us to one woman who has made it her mission to help women of colour get their businesses off the ground. Women-owned businesses continue to play an integral part in the post-COVID-19 pandemic economic recovery in the United States. That's according to a 2023 U.S. government report. And black women-owned businesses in the U.S. have played a growing role, increasing in numbers by 18 percent between 2017 and 2020, per the Brookings Institute. Still, according to one former investment banker, lack of access to vital skills and inadequate funding compared to their male counterparts have proven to be barriers for minority women. We're not investing meaningful dollars into women-owned companies. Gayla Jennings O'Byrne wants to change that. First, we write checks, meaningful checks. So we're writing half million, million dollar checks uh, to women so that they can grow and scale their companies. Um, that's really important. There's a lot of programs, there's a lot of venture funds out there, but not a lot of dollars are getting to women. Especially to black women, the former mergers and acquisitions specialist turned philanthropist also provides specific training through Walkstar, an organization she created that teaches women of color how to raise capital and achieve their business goals. There's a lot of isms in the world, be it sexism, racism. Um, but I think if we go and look beyond that, think about this, CCTV, LASIK, eye surgery, fiber optic cables, caller ID, all of those were invented by black women. Think about what the world would be like if we didn't have that technology. She says the biggest mistake she sees female entrepreneurs make is the fear of asking for seed capital. That's the biggest thing we start with is just breaking down those barriers and building up that ability to ask. And while Jennings O'Byrne says she's thrilled to be a part of the success stories of the women she mentors and invests in, it's not all altruistic. There's a huge arbitrage situation that I and my investors are going to reap the benefits from. And she's got a closing nugget for anyone anxious about starting their own business venture, irrespective of gender or race. My advice is to dream big and do bigger. Failure is okay. Failure is an opportunity to learn. Karina Mitchell, CGTN, New York. Wise words there. Well, more on entrepreneurship and Black History Month. A bookstore in Mississippi has been in business for more than 80 years. It is the oldest Black-owned bookstore in the country. And the owner believes its role in the community is more important now than ever. Dan Williams reports. This is a bookshop with a history. Well, Marshall's Music and Bookstore has been around since 1938. Marshall's Music and Bookstore in Jackson, Mississippi is believed to be the oldest black-owned bookstore in the country. It is situated in Farish Street, once a busy hub for black-owned businesses. Duke Ellington, Ike and Tina Turner, Red Fox, you name it, everyone came. To Fair Street. My auntie Prim's grandmother purchased the store in the 1960s. If I thought that this bookstore was Disneyland. Plastered across the wall are pictures of famous black historical figures. This wall is a wall of respect, it's a wall of honor. It reflects what our community asked us to do on Black History Month, and it has grown since then. Good, how are you? Prim believes it's more important yeah. now than ever to focus on black history. Black History Month should be something that is reflective and something that brings out uh, who we really are as a people. And so black history should strengthen the idea of, of identity. Farris Street has changed significantly over the years. This used to be a thriving area full of shops and businesses. But today, most of the premises stand empty and abandoned. But with rising costs and overheads, as well as the pressure from online shopping, it's an ongoing battle to keep the shop open. We are impacted by everything that happens to black people. We're also impacted by uh, also the economic forces that go on in America. It's, it's for me, uh, a matter of life. 
that this continues on. This institution must continue. For more than 80 years, this shop has been a beacon for the community. Prim is determined that history continues. Dan Williams, CGTN, Jackson, Mississippi. And to talk more on the rise of black female entrepreneurs, I'm joined by Joya Fodu. She's CEO of Joya Fodu LLC and a professional voice actor. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Joy, I know about your inspiring journey from a marketing manager at Instagram to a full-time voice actor and content creator. So I want to start by asking you a two-parter question. One, what made you decide to finally work for yourself? And two, what's been the recipe for your personal success? Honestly, what encouraged me to work for myself is this dream that I had within me. Corporate America is wonderful and full of opportunity. I'm actually not one to speak negatively on it, but I knew that entrepreneurship was calling because now more than ever, it's important that black women take ownership of their stories. So I knew that by starting my own media company, I could hire myself as the lead voice talent and perform healing humor in games, animation, television, as well as sponsored content. My personal recipe for success, honestly, is harnessing the inner child within me because being an adult and an entrepreneur and a grown-up is boring. So I try to bring youthful energy to it whenever I can. Hmm, very nice. Ownership of your own story, you know, I, I like that. Because in the past decade, women have dramatically changed the business landscape. And we know now that black women are the fastest growing demographic entrepreneurs in the US. Uh, what do you think are some of the factors driving this? <laughs> I'm so proud to see this development in black women entrepreneurship. I think, you know, some of us think of black women as being crabs in the barrel in the workplace, but I think the exact opposite. A look back as far as 2002 shows that there's an underwhelming representation of women in ownership roles of arts and entertainment companies. So it's really exciting to see this start to shift and change. I think obviously the, the first thing to look at is the series of layoffs. You've had high performing black executive and manager women laid off across companies here in the US, which is super disappointing, as well as climates and workplaces at these nine to five jobs that just aren't fostering and allowing us a full space for our creativity, for our intellect, for our ingenuity uh, to really be fostered. So unfortunately or fortunately, it's driving most black women to look inside themselves and say, if I didn't have to work for an employer, if I had the chance like Joy to work for myself, what would I do? And so for me, it was becoming an actor and running a media company full time. For other women, that's, you know, for example, leading things in the spirit space, the home decor consulting. And I've seen a lot of black women take their skills in-house. Hmm. Uh, but so it's some encouraging news there. However, on the flip side, only 3% of black women owned companies mature and survive longer than five years. What do these statistics tell us? It's scary. Um, it honestly tells us that we are not being given as much of an equal or equitable shot as our, for example, white male counterparts. If you look even at VC funding, we see less than 2% of VC funding in the U.S. going to black-owned businesses or black-owned companies or startups. So it's disappointing. It's a little bit scary. What that tells us, though, is that we have an opportunity, a major opportunity across sectors to invest in black women who are leading companies Long gone are the days where we need male counterparts to be able to vouch for us or counterparts of other races. We're able to stand on our own and with continued investment and support, we're going to see these businesses last much longer than five years. It's also not necessarily a negative thing. We are creative. So after five years, we might see visions that are even bigger and sell our companies, for example, to start new brands like Honeypot Company. And Joy, it's not just with male counterparts. You know, I was reading earlier a report saying that black women founders, on average, are earning just about one-sixth of the revenue of their white women counterparts. Uh, you talked about an opportunity, but how do you think we can, you know, change this and, you know, like, make that gap closer? Absolutely. As a black woman business owner myself, I think I've seen a revolution, especially between 2020 and 2021, when the U.S. had, you know, this racial awakening or revolution that black lives suddenly mattered. I think it's time for people to go beyond realizing or acknowledging verbally that they matter and investing directly. 
funds are an excellent way, mentorship programs are great, but we need actionable support of these businesses. Contrary to popular belief, it is coming from our community. We are large online media consumers. Black folks and Latino folks are some of the strongest media consumers in the United States. And we've seen evidently that the trends that we produce, our fashion, our language, our culture, our music, it's really running the world, as mm -hmm. Beyonce might say. Hmm. So for me, it's encouraging as a media company owner and producer to have the support of the black community and of these black consumers. We just need to keep stepping up and for others outside to go beyond awareness and recognition to direct investment. You bring up support, Joy. How much support is there for entrepreneurs from minority groups? Let me talk to you about this. So I wrote a paper called The Ethics of the Black Tech Economy. And what made me really nervous is that I looked across the foundation of the United States, the foundation of the internet, of VC funding, of social media platforms. These platforms were largely influenced by, and I'm talking about from, from product uh, to social content, to editorial, to marketing, influenced by black women like me who worked at these companies. However, they weren't specifically built for us. We're still seeing algorithmic suppression. So I think that support looks like not just investment, but for everyone who offers a product or a service to analyze how it's enabling, supporting and encouraging black creativity. These tech products, these internets of things, these creator spaces and creator funds, they haven't prioritized black women. It's taken a lot of black women to study uh, pay gaps, like you mentioned with the one six, the influencer pay gap, like I put my studies to at Santa Clara University, and share that to the rest of the world to say, hey, here's what's happening. But now we've told you what's happening to us. Please, it's time for y'all to step in, also add your resources, add your funds. But it's really time for everyone to do an audit. 2020, was about four plus years ago. So it's time for everybody to step back and see what's been done since 2020. All the commitments that you made publicly as companies, as brands, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. What's the progress that you've made? And if you need a little help, just say so. We'll help. Inspiring, insightful, so full of hope. Thank you so much, Joy Fodu, for joining us. We appreciate your time.